Please join me in congratulating uh, my co-discussants up here. We have Joel Reidenberg and Joshua Kroll. Um, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on biographies. I want to dig into the discussion because you have all that in your paperwork, and you can find them afterwards at the bar. Um, but first, I kind of want to get into the first question to you, Joshua, is talking about this paper is called Accountable Algorithms. And algorithms, or as you call it, automated decisions, um, are not new, right? They've been around for a really long time. They underpin every sector, almost every decision that is made or that, um, that we're impacted by. But they're increasingly sophisticated and ubiquitous, right? So that shows that this is very timely. Uh, it's very important for policymakers, and it's a growing body of research. Um, and there's been a lot of research about how do you make algorithms or automated decisions accountable? Um, how do you make sure that they comply with existing law, that they don't exacerbate or create discrimination? A bunch of different issues, and there's been an increasing number of papers coming out proposing different um, philosophies. But yours, I thought, was very unique and, and interesting, and it seemed practical. Um, so I just hope you could take <coughs> us through a little bit of how you came together, because there's seven co-authors, correct? from a variety of disciplines. So how that came together, how you decided on this approach, um, and did it evolve from when you first started uh, researching? Uh, it evolved quite a bit. Uh, so it, it really kind of started out centering around my dissertation work, uh, which is on uh, how you build uh, kind of verifiable audit logs, and it's the part of the paper that we refer to as procedural regularity, and then as we went on, we kind of built it up and thought, you know, it's, it's nice to speak more generally about how would you uh, build trust in uh, an automated decision system uh, and whether that trust is in the procedural aspects of the system or in sort of more substantive uh, fairness oriented aspects of the system and does that change if the system is programmed by a human or if the system is uh, building a model that's uh, imputed from, from data using machine learning algorithm. Um, and so that is uh, kind of where, uh, where a lot of the ideas in the paper came from, and there was heated discussion uh, among the, the authors at some times as to whether uh, all of the ideas belonged in one paper or whether there were sort of many pieces that, that could come out of this work. Uh, but I'm, I think I'm, we're all quite happy with where it ended up. Joel, is that a fair way to describe it? I think that pretty well sums it up. It was quite a challenge with seven authors uh, from multiple disciplines coming together, uh, trying to really coalesce and show how technical tools could be used in, in this way um, to provide more effective governance of automated decisions where we've seen the existing mechanisms and legal standards just weren't working before. Um, in our discussion, kind of leading up to this event, you said something I thought was really interesting where you took the hard science of computer science and you applied it to the squishiness of policy making um, and it could actually, computer science could, you know, in this application could actually bring to light new squishy areas for policymakers to tackle. So with that kind of as the background framework, um, assuming that not everyone's going to read this paper, which they all should, um, it's only 60 pages, but... 74. <laughs> yeah. We, and, we and came has, in under has, the line, right? It has we fewer format? footnotes than I think it was Danielle's paper. It only has 249 <laughs> or 50. So FPF, that's a new category for prizes next year. Um, but kind of looking at that, what are the three to four key takeaways, I think, that you, that you would leave for a variety of policymakers or people who are really interested in the impact of algorithms or automated decisions, which I like that term better. It's less jargony and it actually is more broad and explains what these things actually do. So, so what are those? What, what do we need to know? So a couple of our key takeaways. One, um, to have the assurance of procedural regularity, meaning that a, there is a rule defined in advance, it's actually being applied in a specific context, and it's being applied consistently. Um, there are lots of technical uh, mechanisms that can be used to assure that uh, in ways that sort of the traditional, in fact, when we started this paper, I think the state of the literature was really uh, Danielle uh, Citroen and, and Frank Pasquale's paper um, that was focusing on transparency of algorithms. And we were concerned that that really, there's, it's a much more complex relationship. So on the one hand, for procedural regularity, you can use things like verification, and Josh can speak much more effectively on the computer science than I can. Um, you can use those tools, so that's one. It means that policymakers have to be thinking about that ex ante when they're uh, looking at either uh, 
oversight of a system or in uh, creating or authorizing a new system uh, to take place. The second and where the squishiness uh, was coming into was we looked at these to uh, see if we could further, uh, if we could use technical tools to further uh, fidelity to substantive policy choices. And that's where we found that um, kind of the state of the art in the policy choices make it difficult in some instances and useful in others. So one of the cases that we examined was discrimination, disparate impact. Um, our discrimination laws have, they don't have hard and fast rules. They have standards. They have standards that after some recent court decisions are murky. Uh, in the murkiness, you have a hard time coming up with uh, clear ways of addressing it. And we have that in the policy arena when we look at trying to apply some of the technologies to uh, provide effective o oversight. It really highlights where the policy choices, where the substantive choices aren't clear. And I think in that sense, there, there is a real opportunity for a dynamic between technologists and policymakers, both to look toward the design of systems that can have effective oversight and improve the policy choices that are being made for society in the process. So that's interesting because you talked about when you first started, transparency was, was where the conversation was and a lot of people have moved off that and this is one of the suggested alternatives. What are the, what are the benefits that this brings that counters the drawbacks of transparency? Uh, I'll say a couple words, and I think I'm going to defer to Josh on some of the computer science. Uh, so I, I guess uh, what I would say is that uh, it's not that we're arguing against transparency, but rather that we're saying that transparency alone is not going to provide the kind of outcomes that uh, people ascribe to it. Uh, and you see that. I think if you go into you know the newest uh, set of, of research in, in terms of you know what does discrimination look like in ad delivery? Or uh, there's a great paper that I'm sure many of you are familiar with from Latanya Sweeney from several years ago about uh, ads and uh, racially valent names and whether ads are suggestive of arrest records. And in both of these uh, pieces of research, uh, there is a strong methodology and yet uh, really no way to turn that methodology into a causal understanding of how um, or why any of these systems do uh, the putative bad thing that they do. Uh, and so it's not to say that you, you can't disclose anything, but to say that you, you, uh, you need to be smart about what you disclose. You need to disclose uh, the right things to convince um, consumers that they're seeing uh, appropriate um, evidence that the system works in, in a way that they, they feel they can trust. Um, and, and I wanted to digest something Joel said into a soundbite that comes from one of uh, our co-authors, Ed Felton, uh, who likes to say that fairness is an ideal, and so we have all this murkiness of policymaking. Uh, and often, uh, computer scientists will say, you know, if you can give me a specification for what I'm supposed to build, I will build it for you, and I will guarantee to you that it works that way and only that way. And we have the technology to do that. Um, but what we don't have the technology to do is to turn something as murky and confusing as a Supreme Court opinion into a set of requirements that we can actually build. Uh, and so what we're left with is, uh, you know, fairness is an ideal, but accountability is achievable. So we may not be able to know how to draw the line between acceptable behavior on one side and unacceptable behavior on the other side, but we can empower someone to uh, stand there, whether that uh, someone is a judge or a legislative committee or uh, the internal inspector general uh, of a government agency or an oversight board at a company uh, and uh, empower that entity to, even after the fact, uh, separate behavior into uh, acceptable or unacceptable uh, and, and take action based on, on that classification. So I want to kind of follow up with, with something. You mentioned machine learning techniques earlier and then also um, how it can be a little bit easier to program hard and fast rules. So a lot of people will, you know, talk about in machine learning, which is increasingly the area that a lot of people are focusing on within artificial intelligence, right? Where it's a technique where machines learn to be clever as opposed to teaching hard, like programming hard and fast rules. So 
do you think that your paper still applies in something like machine learning and, and we, as we get into increasingly sophisticated um, areas of that, like unsupervised learning or deep learning and things like that? Does, do you think the still framework for accountability applies? Uh, I do, and uh, the reason is that what we uh, say is that you, you need to design a system to be accountable in the sense that it empowers an oversight entity to make decisions. It produces sufficient evidence to allow that oversight entity to operate. And I don't think it really matters in that context whether the rule that the system is applying is a rule that was generated by a human through some sort of requirements process and coded up, or whether that rule was inferred from data. Uh, and uh, along with that is sort of the argument that the techniques you use to infer a rule from data can have a valence of their own. So, uh, you know, the choice to use uh, deep learning, not to sort of single deep learning out as a, as a bad technology, because it, it, it can actually, I think, be uh, usefully uh, deployed and, and controlled and, and used. Um, but to, to, to build something which is uh, inscrutable or which you can't even sort of determine after the fact what are the rules or what are the outcomes that this system is producing, um, that has, has a valence with respect to how uh, an overseer uh, or a regulator would view the accountability of that system and ultimately how a consumer would view the accountability of that system. We address actually the specific point in a section in the paper where we talk about fair machine learning. And we look at their various, so one example is if your machine learning, its training data uh, is skewed or is biased. Um, so one way, if that's a concern, that's going to be a worry in some areas. Um, one approach is that the regulator uh, or the policy choice is to intentionally introduce some heterogeneity into the data set so that you're not baking in a particular bias that the training data might have. And from the policymaker's point of view, what this means is you have to be cognizant of this as a problem and you have to be thinking about what the RFP is going to be so that this problem is minimized or eliminated uh, in the automated decision system that's established. And that leads me to my next question. Thank you for that. Um, I, one of the things I think I, that I loved most about this paper is it lays out um, a very helpful tool in the technologist toolbox, right? So all the people who are building the systems that these automated decisions are based on. Um, but it also shows that this same system, this tool, can also be helpful to policymakers and why policymakers at both the legislative and executive branch need to understand automated decision making and to think about these kinds of things. You mentioned the RFP process. What are some other very practical ways that if you a policymaker was in this audience that they could go back and immediately apply or think about whether that's new areas of research to focus on or something to think about, whether that be in, in legislation or, like you said, in the RFP process? I'll start, I mean, there are a couple that I can think of right off the bat. So, for example, <clears throat> a system that's going to have, you know, it's going to be software run, what's the verification that the software is doing what it's supposed to be doing? Um, we have a section uh, that talks about the use of cryptographic commitments, for example, in the paper. So uh, we can easily see, instead of publishing um, a detailed notice in the Federal Register uh, describing a, a rule set and what's supposed to be happening, instead what's published in the Federal Register or some equivalent, uh, would be the cryptographic commitments that then third parties would be in a position to audit and check and see if, in fact, uh, the system did what it was supposed to do. It was applying the rule that it was supposed to be applying, even if we don't know what that is. Uh, you know, one example, uh, I think we addressed this at one point, um, the IRS formula for auditing people. Right? We don't want transparency of that formula. If we provide transparency for it, then it means uh, tax cheats can game the system. But on the other hand, we can have um, public commitments to using a predefined formula, and we can assure that that formula was applied consistently to uh, tax filers to determine who's going to be audited. And for that process to happen, then, as a takeaway, the IRS can publish its, uh, its commitments in Federal Register publicly or on their website uh, in ways that will enable future oversight more effectively than what we have today. 
I, I think there are even simpler things that, that can be done. There's a, a big difference between uh, sort of developing a, a system shotgun and you know having a process where you go through what are the requirements for building the system and you document and you verify that the system that you build and the system that you field is actually meeting those requirements. And then if someone comes in later and says, you know, can I sort of show me your work, show me how you got to this thing that's in the world that is now doing stuff that I, I think may, may not be correct. Um, and you can say, well, you know, we did uh, uh, some testing of the software to ensure that it didn't have bugs in it. Uh, we considered uh, and used these sort of more advanced verification techniques uh, to ensure that there were no bugs. Uh, we used some cryptography to um, find a way to disclose information about how the system was operating or simply uh, to escrow the source code of the system uh, in, in a verifiable way. Um, and that's really what the cryptographic commitments get you, actually, is a, a sort of a, a publicly verifiable escrowing of the source code um, is, I think, a, a nice way to think of it. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, tax systems. Um, the case study that you used in your paper was Visa Lottery. So I think that underscores that automated decision, this is not an issue just within the tech community, right? right. That this is across the board in, in, in every sector in decision. Um, so what guidance would you give to policymakers in terms of areas that they need to focus on or prioritize given the scope of, of the role that automated decisions play in our lives, like what, are, what do you think that should be the, the most sensitive ones or the ones that should be tackled immediately in terms of thinking about how to hold uh, the algorithms accountable? I would certainly look at those areas where automated decision making has real and significant impact on individuals' lives. And a couple that come to mind very quickly, um, uh, loan decision making, uh, employment uh, screening, are, are two big areas where they have direct impact on citizens' lives, uh, and they're increasingly being done by autom automated means. Um, you know, you look at the uh, job application processes that'll get, the resumes will get filtered by some sort of automated decision uh, process. Those are areas where I think we have to be especially uh, careful, that are quite prominent uh, in daily life. Anything to add? I, I, uh... I mean, I think it's also uh, in the public sector, I, I'm quite fond of the visa lottery example because a lottery is such a dead simple process, right? You sort of, you put everyone into, into a hat and you pull out the, the right number of people at random. Uh, and uh, in fact, in, in fiscal year 2012, the State Department managed to build a, a system that, that did that incorrectly. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it, you would be hard pressed to find a first semester computer science student who, who could build a, a system that would do that incorrectly. Uh, although, first semester computer science students will often surprise you. Um, I think we have one minute for audience questions, more or less. So, if there are any, if you would just raise your hand and identify yourself. So, just to repeat the question how can your average consumer? challenge a decision that is made based on an algorithm or, or is it an automated decision? What recourse do they have? Well, I don't know if you want to tackle yeah, I guess you know, it's going to depend on what the gov enabling governing statute is for the particular bureaucratic decision that was made. But I think, and the real purpose and message of this paper is to say that the existing methods that we've had and our legal standards make it very hard, if not impossible, for that average citizen to mount a successful challenge. Um, if, for example, the argument is that um, it, it was a biased decision uh, and the response from the bureaucracy is, well, these are the only inputs that we used for the system and this is what happened, how do you argue that? Well, it may turn out to be that the combination of inputs, data inputs they were using resulted in uh, a good proxy for something that creates bias. Uh, it's going to be very hard in today's systems, I think, to show that, whereas uh, using the methods that, that we explore in the paper would make it much easier in the future for an aggrieved uh, individual to uh, make a successful complaint if some kind of wrongful act was taken with respect to that individual. I, I often worry that uh, when, we, when we think like this, we think 
uh, we're giving too much deference to the technology. We're effectively saying, uh, you know, the, the computer says this is so, therefore it is so. Um, and that, I think, discounts the fact that these computer systems are always fielded and will always be fielded by a human or an organization. Uh, and that uh, entity uh, needs to take responsibility for whatever the system is doing. And um, ultimately that entity is going to be governed somehow by some oversight uh, process or some governing statute depending on the particular application. Um, and I would defer to, to the lawyers in the room as to exactly which of those things is in effect at any particular time. Uh, but I think it's important not to, not to imbue the technology uh, with uh, an aura of truth, but rather to think of it as a human artifact and to say that it, we're, we're governing it as a human artifact. It's a thing that people did, not uh, a truth, not mathematical truth, just because uh, it's you know, driven by math doesn't mean that it's, it's truth uh, that existed from before the universe. Right? It's something I like that people like those analogies of artifacts. Jules, I think you had a question? Yes, and I, I think that's one of the important um, messages in the paper, uh, actually, is that uh, automated decision making is an opportunity, uh, not so much the challenge that it has been viewed uh, as in the literature, but rather, uh, you know, when decisions made by a human, as you point out, the human may have some kind of uh, bias, some maybe an implicit bias that they don't even recognize that they have, uh, and therefore cannot, you know, notate. Uh, even if you ask them really nicely to provide notes on when they made the decision. Uh, if the decision is made by a rule uh, that is written in software, we can actually introspect on what that rule is and we can, we can have some sort of open or notice-driven process for creating and refining that rule. Uh, and we can also verify that the rule that went through that process and that was approved by uh, you know, your, your favorite oversight board uh, the decided this particular rule for deciding who's, who's a tax cheat or who's likely to be a tax cheat um, is the rule that we should use. We can verify that in a particular case, that is the rule that was used. Uh, and that, I think, is a very exciting opportunity for technology. If I could just add, I mean, I think the message is, um, yes, that's the hope, that's the opportunity. It will be achieved only if it's implemented properly uh, through the automated decision process. Are there any more audience questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah, so just to summarize, uh, the question was about uh, whether when you're learning a rule from data, if you can uh, improve the chance that it won't um, discriminate against a protected status attribute that you are concerned about, uh, if you simply omit that attribute from the features available to train the rule. And I, I think the consensus in, in computer science now is uh, that uh, blindness to uh, a sensitive attribute uh, is really uh, a negative for, for fairness and for non-discrimination. Uh, and some examples of why that, that is the case, um, it's the, the simplest is that you can always find, uh, or you can often find proxies for the, the value that you care about. So uh, the easy example here, of course, is in the credit uh, space. Uh, we uh, find that redlining, which is making a credit decision based on the physical location of the borrower rather than their uh, perceived creditworthiness, uh, is facially illegal in the United States. Um, and then it may be the case that different populations, say different uh, racial groups, have very different, uh, you know, the, the, they, they function very differently with respect to the prediction task that you're working on. So suppose you're trying to predict the incidence of a disease, such as heart disease. Um, we know that heart disease is uh, very differently incident in different uh, ethnic groups. And so a model that works for one ethnic group is not necessarily likely and not even intuitively likely to function well for another ethnic group for which it was not properly trained. Uh, and an example of this that uh, I've seen used is uh, that in um, the, the Native American community, it's very common for people to have unique names uh, that, that no one else has. Uh, and in other uh, communities, it's quite common for us to make names by taking uh, from some 
medium-sized set of first names and medium-sized set of last names and just mixing them up. And that's sort of sufficiently, you know, there are a lot of John Smiths in the world, uh, but um, some, some names are unique and in, in a group of this size, there probably aren't, there probably isn't another Josh Kroll here. I know there are other Josh Krolls in the world, um, but suppose that you're now trying to find which profiles on a social network are fake. Um, if you don't know that someone is uh, a Native American or not, then you can't tell whether their unique name is or is not a sign that their profile is fake. Uh, and so it's, it's actually quite a negative to be blind, uh, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of uh, the field uh, at this point, that blindness is, is an appropriate way to, to reduce discrimination in machine learning. Thank you very much. I hope you will all read this paper. I thought it was very well done and definitely an important discussion that I hope that we will continue both within Future Privacy Forum and, and otherwise. So please join me in a hearty congratulations to Joshua and Joel.